one miracle after another. The Pavel Goya Story Chapter 13 One Day at a Time Pavel was feeling frustrated. He had been a pastor for several years now, without ever receiving theological training. He didn't like the way it felt when church members asked him questions he couldn't answer. It just didn't seem as if he was meeting the needs of his people or representing God as well as he should. If he were going to continue as a pastor, he felt it would be important to have some theological training. After praying about it, he sent an application to nearly every seminary in Europe, hoping one of them would help him finish his education. He would have to wait and see which ones responded. As he and Dana talked about it, they agreed that if an invitation did come, they would need some money for travel expenses. Without having any resources other than their car, they decided to put it up for sale, advertising it in the newspaper. After waiting for some time with no responses, they decided to advertise it at an auto auction. Only one person responded. As Pavel walked out to the car with the interested buyer, he told him how happy he had been with it. As they walked, he elaborated the many fine qualities of his car. It had been one of the most mechanically sound cars they had ever owned. With a smile, Pavel put the key into the ignition. But after repeated attempts to start the car failed, he gave up in frustration. It just wouldn't start. The man liked the pretty paint job, but it wouldn't do him much good if the engine didn't run. When the man left, both he and Pavel were disgusted. A few minutes after the prospective buyer left, Pavel went out to try to discover what had gone wrong with his car. This time, when he put the key into the ignition, the car started on the first try, purring as if it had just returned from having a tune-up. He felt both relieved and angry at the same time. It appeared God didn't want them to sell their car. After a few months went by without a single university responding to his letters, he felt like giving up in discouragement. He was now thankful their car hadn't started. At least they still had something to drive. Pavel and Dana decided they were not going to worry about the seminary training any longer. If God wanted Pavel to go to school, it was his problem, not theirs. Putting the whole idea out of their minds, they went back to work for God wholeheartedly. After another few months, Pavel received a phone call from his brother-in-law who lived in Germany. He encouraged them to sell their car for he had an excellent source for wholesale parts and would be willing to pass on the savings to them if they would purchase a car made in Germany. Pavel graciously declined his suggestion since they had just tried selling their car. It seemed as if it would be a waste of time and money to try again. Why go through the whole discouraging process all over again? The next day, Pavel answered a knock at the door. A stranger introduced himself and asked if he could see the car they were selling. I'm sorry, but it isn't for sale anymore. How did you even hear about it anyway? Pavel wanted to know. The man replied, My wife was getting ready to start a fire the other day using an old newspaper. And just before lighting it, she glanced down and saw your ad. It was just the kind of car she's always wanted. Even the color is her favorite, the man added enthusiastically. I drove all the way from Timisoara just to buy it. I guess that should tell you how much my wife wants your car. Look, she sent me with cash to make sure there wouldn't be any problem, he said, holding out his hand, bulging with money. I'm sorry, it really isn't for sale. We would just have to go out and look for another car if we sold this one. It's been good to us, and we're happy with it. I'm sorry you drove all the way from Timisoara for nothing, Pavel explained to the disappointed man. 
that evening, Pavel received a totally unexpected phone call. Hey, Pavel, this is Lauren from the United States. How have you been? Mystified, Pavel replied, I, I don't think I know you, do I? Of course you do. We used to sing in the choir together in Bucharest. You remember me? We're related now. I married your cousin. Oh, yes, I remember you now. But how did you expect me to remember you after not seeing each other for more than 12 years, Pavel replied, as many warm memories came back to him. How is everything going for you and your family? Everything has been going well for us here. We own a large construction company that keeps us very busy. But let me tell you the reason I called. My wife and I couldn't sleep a few nights ago. You just kept coming into our minds. We tossed and turned all night. The next day, we did a little check-in and found out you had become a pastor. We really felt impressed to invite you to come to Tennessee to go to school. I'm making plenty of money and would be glad to cover the cost of your education. All that he had been taught in school by the communist government about living in the United States flashed through his mind. He remembered hearing how dangerous it was to live there. People walking down the streets were often shot or stabbed. Women and children were regularly abducted. With most people addicted to drugs, vice was rampant. There is no way I would move my family to such a dangerous place, Pavel replied. Lauren laughingly reassured him that it was not at all the way the communist propaganda had portrayed it. Some of those things might be true in the large cities, but we live in the country. We don't even lock our doors at night. In Romania, you know what would happen if you left your bicycle unattended in your front yard for even a minute. Here, my bicycle has been sitting in front of my house for years, and no one has ever touched it. Let me assure you, your family would be safe. Why don't you just pray about it? and see if God is leading you to continue your education here, his friend suggested. After Lauren's phone call, Pavel and Dana realized it must have been God who had inspired the phone call from Germany and sent the man to buy their car. If they were to move to the United States, they would need money for travel expenses. They would need to sell their car after all. Now they wished they had written down the name and address of the man who had come to see the car the day before. Without a name, it would be impossible to find him again. He lived in Timisoara, about 75 miles to the west, along with 300,000 other people. If God wanted them to move to the United States, he would have to open many doors. The first being the sale of their car. Together, Pavel and Dana knelt, asking God to reveal his plan for their lives. If you want us to sell our car, please bring the man who was interested back again. You know we have no way to contact him. We leave all our plans in your hands, they prayed. The next day, the man returned, hoping he could get them to reconsider. Returning home without the car of his wife's dreams had not been a pleasant experience, and he knew he wouldn't have a moment's peace unless he came home with the car. I'll be glad to pay you more than your asking price to make it worth your while, but please, don't ask me to face my wife again without your car, he pleaded. Without a doubt, the trip back to Timmy Sawara would be more enjoyable for the relieved husband this time than it had the day before. He was driving his wife's dream car back home. It certainly appeared that God was opening the way for Pavel to go to seminary in America. The transition would not be easy, especially with Gabriel in fourth grade and their newest addition, Ovidiu, in first. Dana was not looking forward to moving again, to say the least. She was quite happy where they were. Shortly after Lauren's phone call, 
they received a letter from Southern Adventist University in Collegedale, Tennessee. The letter stated that Pavel had been accepted as a student for the coming semester beginning in August. At the end of the letter was the promise found in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. If God was really leading them to Tennessee, it would require a trip to the American Embassy for visas. If they would be some of the fortunate few to actually get them, they knew it would be nothing short of a miracle. Almost everyone attempting to get one returned in bitter disappointment. With an appointment scheduled, the Goya family borrowed a car from a good friend at church and set out for Bucharest. As they drove along, Dana further clarified her position. She was not in favor of moving to a country in which they had no friends or family and did not speak the language. She made sure Pavel knew she was praying that their visas would be denied. Arriving at the embassy late at night, they parked nearby and slept for a few hours. At three the next morning, Pavel opened his daily devotional book to spend a few moments with God before beginning his long wait in line to apply for visas. Opening to the page for the day, he discovered that the scripture text was Jeremiah 29, 11, the same passage of promise as on his acceptance letter. Was this a coincidence? Or was God trying to tell him something? He soon would see. Getting out of the car, he joined the others waiting in the four abreast line that was already beginning to snake around the block. Apparently the ones at the beginning of the line had been standing there all night. Registering just after 3 a.m. in the morning, he became number 956. Waiting hour after hour in the long line, he watched people repeatedly exit the embassy with disappointed hopes and dashed dreams. Many wept bitterly when the privilege of visiting a friend or relative in the United States was denied. Of the hundreds of people applying for a visa, he had seen only four or five leave with smiles on their faces. It appeared that it wouldn't be all that difficult for God to answer Dana's prayer for the denial of their visas. It was almost noon before his turn came to speak to a representative. Stepping up to his assigned booth, he introduced himself to the waiting official. Why do you want to go to the United States? The consul coldly began. I want to go to school, Pavel answered calmly. You must know that there are schools in Romania. Why don't you go to one of them? I know we have schools here, but they aren't accredited. I want to attend a seminary that will help me be the best pastor I can, Pavel informed him. You're just like everyone else. You just want to go and try to make a lot of money, the official retorted sternly. No, that's not true. I gave up a lot of money to become a pastor. Money has nothing to do with it. Can you prove that? Sure, you can easily verify my previous businesses. If I were to give you a visa, how do I know you would come back? You don't. Then I can't give you a visa. That's okay with me, Pavel said, turning to walk away. Wait, come back here a minute, the consul called. Aren't you sorry you won't be able to go to school? No, attending the seminary is not up to me because I've given it to God in prayer. It's entirely up to Him. I'm not begging to go. It would be much easier to stay here. If I go, I would have to start life all over again, even learning a new language. So if God wants me to go, I will go. If not, I will stay. If He wants me to go to some remote part of Africa, I will go. If He wants me to go to war-torn Yugoslavia, I will go. Well, if I let you go alone, you would be able to go to school 
and we wouldn't have to worry about you coming back when you are finished. How does that sound to you? The official offered as a compromise. Sir, do you have a family? Pavel asked earnestly. Yes, I do. Would you leave them and go to another country for several years? I guess I wouldn't, the official admitted. Well, neither will I. If all of us can't go together, I'm not going at all. Then I'm afraid I can't let you go, the official replied in frustration. As I said before, it really doesn't matter to me either way. Then you will never get to see America. I don't care. That was never my reason for wanting to go anyway, Pavel said disinterestedly. If I were to give your family visas, would you promise me you would come back? No, Pavel answered the bewildered official. Then I can't give your family visas. That's okay. I don't care. You see, if God wants me to come back, I will come back. If he wants me to stay, I will stay. But until I know what God wants me to do, I can't promise anyone, Pavel explained. You are one crazy pastor, the mystified consul replied. Then he just stared in silence for several minutes before saying, I'm going to give you and your family their visas. After collecting his documents, Pavel left the embassy, not knowing whether he should be happy or sad. Realizing he had just become one of the few out of nearly 1,000 applicants to get a visa, he knew a move to the United States had to be a part of God's plan. He was also quite sure he knew a person who would not be rejoicing. All her pleading had not altered God's plan for their family. When Pavel showed Dana their visas, one for each member of the family, she couldn't believe it. She had also witnessed the number of people who were being turned away. The odds of Pavel returning with visas were so slim that she hadn't been really too concerned although she did continue her wishful prayers. When Pavel returned with the documents in hand, it was clear that she and God had different plans. After giving away everything they owned, they set out for the airport. Already, Dana was feeling homesick, but in spite of her feelings, she too wanted to follow God wherever he was leading. The little family boarded the plane. Destination, Collegedale, Tennessee, and the United States of America. Lauren helped them find an apartment and register for school, paying all their expenses for the first two months. When their bills came due again, Lauren called to let them know he'd be leaving town for a couple of days. He was going to collect a final payment on a large construction project one of his crews had just finished. When he came back, he would pay their expenses for the rest of the year as a matter of convenience to them both. A day or two later, Pavel and Dana received a phone call informing them that Lauren had gone into cardiac arrest while on his business trip. After assessing his condition, doctors quickly determined that he was suffering an acute case of amnesia. Lauren didn't even know who his wife was, let alone Pavel and Dana. Without medical insurance, Lauren had accumulated such enormous medical bills that it wouldn't have mattered if he did remember them. Now, they were alone in a strange country with no friends. They didn't know the language and had very little food remaining on their shelves. And to make matters worse, their rent was due. They felt more helpless and alone than at any time they could remember. In tears, Dana cried out in prayer, Dear God, you know we weren't the ones asking to come here, and I even prayed that we wouldn't. But you worked 
miracle after miracle to bring us here. Why would you let this happen? Surely it wasn't your plan to bring us here, then let us starve to death? Having given their plight to God, they decided they wouldn't tell anyone of their dire need. God understood it all. He surely had a solution to their dilemma. The next day, while walking across campus, Pavel decided to talk to God about his need at a special place known as the prayer guard. Leaning up against a large maple tree, he prayed as the tears ran down his cheeks. Lord, I know you brought us here. Please don't forsake us now. A firm pat on the back interrupted his tearful prayer. It was the dean of the seminary. What's wrong, Pavel? It looks as though things aren't going so well. In the few English words he knew, Pavel replied, We are facing some challenges just as all students do and have been asking God for help. Please come to my office. I want to hear more of your story, the dean urged. Arriving at his office, Pavel explained all of the unfortunate circumstances that had just taken place. They didn't know what to do next. We aren't asking for anything from anyone, but you asked, and now you know a little of what we are facing. We just don't know what to do next. Well, if God brought you here, surely he will provide for your needs. I'm sure you must know that by now, the dean reminded him. The next Sabbath, the campus pastor preached his sermon from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know the plans that I have for you. The words of encouragement from this passage were just what Pavel and Dana needed to hear. Leaning over to her, he whispered, Dana, he's preaching from our verse. They listened attentively as the pastor detailed many of the challenges that Moses faced as God called him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. It wasn't Moses' ability that God needed as much as his availability. It wasn't what Moses held in his hand that made the difference. It was what God could do with him. Continuing his message, the pastor reminded the congregation how inadequate Moses felt when God's plan included going to a country in which he couldn't even speak the language. Facing each other in the pew, Pavel and Dana both knew that God was speaking directly to them. While sitting in the pew with tears rolling down their cheeks, they asked God to forgive them for ever doubting him. Once again, they resolved to trust him for all their needs. Shaking hands with the pastor on the way out of the sanctuary, they thanked him for allowing God to use him to speak words that were just for them. Who are you? the smiling pastor inquired. We are students at seminary from Romania, they said, as they thanked him again. The apartment shelves were still bare, but the dark cloud that had followed them to church that morning had vanished. In God's presence, the sunlight of heaven had broken through. Their circumstances had not changed, but they were God's children, and they knew he would take care of them. The following Thursday evening, Pavel responded to a knock at the door. It was the pastor. He wondered if he could come in and talk to them for a few minutes. He informed them that the dean had already shared part of their story with him, and he wanted to hear the rest of it. When they finished detailing their situation, the pastor told them that the dean had already offered to pay all of Pavel's tuition for the year, but on one condition. He had to finish his two-year course in one year and still maintain an excellent grade point average. The pastor then said he would talk to the church about paying their housing and insurance. They would have to pay for their food, utilities, and Pavel's textbooks on their own. Dana soon found three homes to clean, in addition to caring for an older woman during the day and an elderly man at night. 
With Pavel tuning a few pianos, they managed to barely scrape by. In order to finish his classes in one year, Pavel had to take 21 credits the first semester and 19 the second, followed by 17 in the summer. In his spare time, he had to learn English and take a computer class. He felt equally lost in both classes, not knowing even how to turn on a computer. He spent many nights praying by his bed with a dictionary in hand while trying to figure out how to type using all foreign characters on the keyboard. His assignments usually took him till about 3 a.m. in the morning to complete. With only an hour's sleep, he'd get up in order to have time to pray before starting the new day. His schedule was unbelievable, but he made it through with God's help. When the school year was finished, Pavel graduated magna cum laude. With only a few weeks remaining until graduation, the dean of the seminary approached Pavel with the same offer of sponsorship for his Master of Divinity degree. If he could complete his master's degree at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan in half the time while maintaining his same grade point average, he would again pay his tuition. Only two weeks remained until the fall semester at Andrews University was to begin. He had no money and no way to move his family, and they had to move out of the student housing that had been their residence. Once again, they couldn't move forward and they couldn't stay where they were. Learning of their predicament, the son of the retired man that Dana was caring for came to the rescue. Again and again, he had helped them through emergencies. The entire Goya family was extremely grateful for this kind man who had repeatedly shared his time and means. He had made them feel as if they were members of his own family. As family members, he invited them to move in with him until they decided what they were going to do. Even though they were not sure how they could ever make the move to Andrews University or where they would live once they got there, the dean registered Pavel and paid his tuition. Pavel called the student housing department repeatedly, hoping an apartment had become available, but everything was still full. With only two days until classes were to begin, it appeared that the move would be impossible. Even if they could find a way to get there, they wouldn't have a place to live. Later that day, a truck driver called the house where the Goya family was staying to make sure someone was there. He had a table to deliver from an aunt in Florida. She had asked the driver to deliver it since their home wouldn't be too far out of his way. From there, he would be driving to Andrews University with a load of furniture for a student. After the driver unloaded the table, Pavel and Dana's kind host asked if there was any way the driver could fit the Goya's family things on his truck as they needed to find a way to Andrews University. I would if I had room, he said regretfully, but I have another house full of furniture belonging to a student here in Tennessee to still fit onto this load. A couple hours after the truck driver left, he called back with some good news. The student from Tennessee had decided to postpone his move until the following semester. He was on his way back to load the Goya's things. Equally thrilling was the fact that the expenses of the trip had been paid by the two conferences sponsoring the students. The driver was offering to take their things free of charge. After loading their things, the driver wanted to know where he should unload them when he got there. That was another problem. They still didn't have an apartment, so they decided that a storage unit was the only option. The driver began his trip north. No more than an hour after the truck had rolled out of sight, the phone rang again. It was the housing department at Andrews University. An apartment had just become available. Quickly, Pavel called the driver with their new address. In just two hours, he had secured an all-expenses-paid move and an apartment. 
God had just moved mountains of impossibilities and they were on their way to the next step of Pavel's pastoral education. In all his ways, he had acknowledged God and now he would experience the desire of his heart. As Pavel began his studies at the seminary, he and his family faced a host of new challenges. But certain that God had not brought them this far to leave them helplessly to their own resources, they were confident that God would continue to come through for them. Each time the Goya family watched God remove an impossible obstacle from their path, their faith grew. He came through in every emergency, although often at the last minute. Needed money would come just at the critical time of crisis. The amount owed and the amount received often matched to the penny. Trusting completely in God's care, Pavel and Dana decided not to focus on their problems any longer, but instead to find others experiencing greater need than their own to encourage. When they miraculously received food, they shared it with those they knew to be in extreme need. Each time they shared with others, God replenished their supply. They were repeatedly reminded that it is more thrilling to be a channel for God's blessing than to be just a grateful recipient. After watching God faithfully meet their needs, the Goya family began praising him before seeing any evidence of his answer, and their joyful expressions were contagious. Many other struggling students were encouraged to face their problems by praising God rather than by pleading for his help. No doubt, heaven smiled as it received the gratitude and praise flowing from the Goya family and those who shared their discovery. Pavel found himself smiling as he contemplated God's many providences for him and his family since leaving Romania. Although he had taken a leave from the ministry to receive further training, his ministry had not ceased. In his new life as a student, God had used him to encourage countless other students and teachers along the way. They were his new congregation. With graduation from the seminary approaching, Pavel began to wonder where God's plan would lead him next. He reminded God that he meant what he had said to the customs officer in Romania. He would go wherever he wanted him to go when his education was complete. As he prayed to know God's will, his prayer as a five-year-old under the apple tree in the churchyard came vividly back to mind. The verses in Jeremiah promised that he would speak for God. With his university education nearing an end, he determined that wherever the plan of providence led him, he would indeed be a spokesman for God. The end of chapter 13 of one miracle after another, the Pavel Goya story.